morning. So everybody's very excited for the new era for digital digital slide imaging. So kicked off here. So can everybody see all of the companies listed here? Does anybody have any idea what they have in common? They've all so, failed in the last few years. That's a rough time, right? So the first of which borders you see have the store closing signs that kind of hopefully gives it away. So borders, Blockbuster, Kodak, and Polaroid. These are all the years that these companies filed for bankruptcy. So chapter 11, so Polaroid, obviously in the film industry, so they filed for bankruptcy and they failed to see you know digital photography as a transforming field similar with kodak in 2012 blockbuster failed to innovate a digital solution for their videos or game solutions and you can see it just so happens to be that netflix also in the same year that they filed for bankruptcy added their digital streaming services so that seems to be coincidental right Orders, the ebook market uh, jump started about 2009. So, in that interim period before when they filed for bankruptcy, they also didn't invest in any digital solutions. So, these are all companies who pretty much failed to realize that whatever digital transformation is happening in their own field, and it's kind of a word to the wise. So, for this presentation, we'll go through the digital imaging basics because they are important to know when dealing with those light imaging. We'll go through a brief history of uh, digital pathology, talk about the digital pathology ecosystem, and then we'll spend a majority of the talk uh, on whole slide imaging. Specific use cases that people, that pathologists and laboratories will use them for, briefly touch image analysis, as well as the current challenges in whole slide imaging. So digital imaging basics. So the fundamental unit of an image is a pixel. The pixel is also short for a picture element. And then all those, and then a similar image information, bit depth or color depth is a 2D matrix of those pixels arranged in rows and columns. So it's an X and Y axis. And then the bit is defined as the basic unit of information. So bit is a binary unit. So it's either a zero or a one. And each length of a binary number is encodes a specific color. So for instance, if you're a 24, color bit depth, or 24 color depth, or 24 bit, de bit depth. That means each pixel is a 24 digit in length number, and then each one of those numbers is either a zero or one. And then depending on whatever permutation of those colors, it's gonna encode a specific color in the light spectrum. So in 24 bit depth, it's always two to the end in terms of how many different total color variations exist. So that's an example of the amount of colors depending on the quantity of the bit depth. Images can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional, so medical imaging is predominantly two-dimensional. Uh, however, you know, there is technology for image reconstruction to generate three images. You know, radiology has done a great job of this with, um, you know, if anybody's seen anybody with a baby recently or you've had one of your own, you see that they have these reconstructed images where you can now even see the, the baby's face in utero. Diagnostic, uh, a lot of diagnostic specialties that Pretty predominantly surround medical imaging, obviously radiology and pathology. Two main differences is in radiology is essentially the grayscale, whereas in pathology it covers the complete, you know, color gamut, the whole the light color spectrum. Radiology is much more patient centric and they interpret their exams as opposed to pathology, which is very specimen centric where we follow the specimen around. So the difference between a color model and a color space. So the RGB color model is pretty much the basic color model that a lot of the other color spaces are then modified to use. So the human eye can detect up to about a million colors, a million distinct colors. And we all know that pathology has a long list of artifactual stains where pretty much all of the color that is used in pathology is artifact. You know, H and E are reagent stains and we use these to create different concentrations of you know, the hematoxylin and niacin. So these are all artifacts of special stains and immunohistochemistries and whatnot. So 
CMYK, cyanogenta, you know, and then though that's used for pretty much print. That's a print model color space. And then HSB, which stands for hue, saturation, brightness. So then that's pretty much a color wheel representation of the RGB color model where you can see on the different axes it the saturation or intensity gets uh, more saturated, more intense on one area. It includes all of the color spectrums in hue, and then it goes from light to dark. So this is a representation of the color and the bit depth. So if you see on the far right, you have your X and Y matrix rows and columns of pixels, and each specific pixel, so in this example, is a 24 bit depth as we had before. Each has uh, a channel for green, red, and blue. And because it's 24 bit depth, that means there's eight bits for each specific uh, color schema. And the binary numbers will change depending on the specific color. And then depending on that 24 bit length binary coding of numbers, you'll come out and say, okay, this pixel is yellow, this pixel is the shade of orange. So this is essentially how the pixels are interpreted and pixels will become very important in terms of image analysis as well as the whole slide imaging itself. So I'm talking about pixel resolution or pixel density. The pixel resolution is essentially the X and Y columns and rows for the pixels and then you can multiply that by the bit depth get the number of bits for the file. And then one byte equals eight bits, so that's how you can calculate the actual file size that the image will take. So it's very dependent on the pixel resolution and bit depth of the image. The pixel density is different, which refers to the actual image output. So for instance, if the image output is, you know, an image being printed in a magazine or some other print, the pixel density will be dots per inch. And then likewise, if it's a digital image monitor, you know, an image being represented on a monitor's display, that's PPI, which is pixels per inch. Now schematic to represent this, so pixel resolution again we said, so it's the matrix, right? So the top left is a two by two, so you have two by two pixels in the X direction and two in the Y. However, as you increasing as you increase the pixel resolution, you can see that the picture looks much more crisp, much more clear. You can detect a lot more detail with the amount of pic when the pixels increase. Pixel density. So you see each square is both about 2.54 centimeters or one inch. And then if you have 10 pixels per inch, you can see the density is a lot less, less information than if you had a much higher pixel density, you can have a lot more image information with a higher pixel density. So how are images acquired? The first step in the imaging process is obviously the image acquisition. So the CCD and CMOS, so the charge couple devices, these are types of sensors. These are pretty much the two main types of sensors that if anybody's very interested in photography or has any uh, interest in those, you'll probably be familiar with these. So these sensors convert the signal voltage to digital information. So as the photograph is taken, the sensor is pretty much, they're, you know, they're different size sensors and larger sensors can capture more pixels. That's, that's a lot of people in photography are very, uh, I guess, anal about which sensors they have. And then these sensors will convert the signal voltage to the digital information, which ultimately converts it into pixels. And that pixel data is stored out of internal or external memory. And then you can see the differences between the CCD and the CMOS with the photoelectric conversion and, and how they actually do it. But ultimately, they don't produce the same thing where they'll, they change the, uh, they store the pixel data. Okay, image file compression. So compression is ultimately removing redundant information. And you can consider that as an example of, you know, Pixels are the same colors, ultimately redundant information. And this is done to reduce the, the image size, and reducing the image size obviously will help processing, storage, and transmitting that image. Because the larger the file size, the more it takes, the more computational power it takes, the more time it will take to render it, and the more storage it will take, and the longer it will take to transmit. However, 
image compression, you do need to take into consideration the image quality versus the file size. Because obviously the more data you can store in the file, the, the larger the file size is, and you may have better image quality, but there's a lot of push to have the small, the smaller, the, as small as the file size to have with the highest quality. Different types of compression algorithms, so if you've heard of any of uh, these examples, TIFF, JPEG, so there are two main types of image compression algorithms. One's lossless, one's lossy. So lossless pretty much means that you're reducing the storage without any loss of data. So this example, you know, if you have three A's, three B's, three C's, the image will encode or compress that data and just put, you know, three A, three B, three C as opposed to having the exact pixel information there. But that's to compress it, and but when you decompress it, it'll go completely back and the exact pixel data will be restored uh, as the original image, so that's lossless. Lossy compression will actually remove the unnecessary detail, so that's the loss of the compression actually loses that information, and when you decompress it, it's not there again. So then the actual decompressed image will be different in the pixel data, but hopefully not to the extent to the human eye. So the file sizes will be significantly lower with the lossy compression. The lossless will have higher file sizes, but are known to have higher quality because they're keeping all the exact same pixel data. And these are some common file types and uh, image compression uh, formats. Lossy, you know, JPEG or similar JPEG and or GIS. Lossless, again, they're gonna have higher file sizes but are known to have better image quality. So raw files, which pretty much any file stored in, uh, you know, anybody's interested in photography, they get stored in raw files. Uh, bitmaps or PNG files. And then there's this kind of mid-tier uh, compression algorithm where it's lossless where you can either have, there, there exists lossy and lossless version uh, of these image compression file formats, so TIFF or JPEG 2000. It can be either. All right, image quality obviously is very important when we're talking about imaging. So for digital files, you wanna have, you know, the best resolution, you wanna have low noise, adequate contrast, and color fidelity to match whatever your original image was, your original object was. And there's a lot of equipment that goes into place when talking about image quality. So looking at the optics, uh, you know, the pathology of a microscope, so we're looking at, you know, either the objective, it does it have a high NA, how much light is passing through, looking at the dynamic range of the, of the camera, the sensor type and quality and size, the artifacts which, you know, can go into place with image compression. Because these are all digital, digital images, do, do we have adequate computing processing, uh, graphics card to render these images appropriately? What about our actual monitor or display? How high resolution is it? So there's a lot of factors and variables that come into account with image quality. DICOM, so DICOM is the Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine. So DICOM is, you know, either there have been a primary radiology standard, now that yeah. pathology is becoming much more interested in digital imaging and whatnot, there's a lot of push in the field to potentially standardize the whole slide images in DICOM. So DICOM is a file format and also a actual messaging protocol for these images. So the DICOM images are not just the images, it's images attached with metadata. So those, so the DICOM transfer protocol will include the image, the exam, the patient information. So all of this is actually transported with the image and these are stored in kind of an enterprise pack system where they can be accessed throughout radiology departments. And some of the move, some movements that have been happening with DICOM in recent years, they've added two diff different supplements. So supplement 122, which pretty much defines a specimen object model and how that can be incorporated. And then specifically for whole slide imaging, supplement 145 is probably important to remember for how to actually render whole slide imaging uh, in, in the DICOM format in the pyramid schema, which we'll talk about. So there are alternatives that exist to DICOM conversion for specifically for pathology because this is relatively new trying to figure out exactly what is the most useful way to transport and access or share these digital images in, in pathology. 
So OpenSlide is actually a open source tool that was developed at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And OpenSlide decodes a lot of their pri proprietary full slide imaging vendors uh, file formats. So OpenSlide is able to read the, the, the larger vendors uh, whole slide images and encode them and, and present them in the same viewer. Also, VNA is a vendor neutral archive, so vendor neutral archive accepts non com images, so a vendor neutral archive may be able to host a lot of these different whole slide imaging file formats in their own native file format structure, and then they'll need their own specific vendor viewers to, to view those. Today, there does not exist a flawless whole slide image that I have experienced, so that's why people are looking into alternatives. All right, the history of digital pathology. So digital microscopy started really just with a camera mounted onto a microscope, if you want to envision it as that. So in the 1990s, these pioneers really looked into whole slide imaging and how it could be incorporated. So the microscope attached with an integrated camera is really just used to, the camera is used to capture photos of each field of view and they stitched all of those photos together in a tile-based mosaic pattern. So it's pretty much a grid where they would go from each field of view, next, next, and they would stitch all those together. So obviously, this is a much more manual process. It took a very long time to capture an entire slide. And that's just one focal plane. And then again, these are, you know, it has to be manually kept in focus, et cetera. So it's very labor intensive. So it created extremely large file sizes. And imagine if you wanted to do, if you wanted to image the slides in multiple focus planes, yeah, you can create very large file sizes. Subsequently, after some uh, efforts by our Wetzel and John Gilbertson, really pushed some automation of whole slide scanners. And <coughs> with the advent of uh, newer technology, there were better lenses, objectives of microscopy, with robotic engineering to automate these systems and having higher resolution camera sensors, they were able to really push the, the automation of digital pathology. Newer technologies such as robotic remote microscopy really help telepathology and allow remote users to access these without needing somebody to control the microscope where they can remotely control these systems. And then today, you know, there are numerous vendors in the, in the field that are they're mass producing these whole slide scanners. They're being used pretty much all over the world right now. And there are different types of whole slide scanners that have different features depending on the capabilities of the lab that they or the dependencies of the lab that they need. And today we can scan whole slides, whole, whole slides uh, images in minutes, and there are scanners that it can uh, hold a lot of uh, throughput. So this is a representation of just, you know, a camera and integrated, this is integrated microscopy. The camera is sitting on top of the microscope, and you see in the camera housing, there is a C-mount, which attaches onto the camera, as well as the CCD set, so the image sensor prop, being able to capture the image here. Then this sensor captures all that pixel data, stores it electronically, and then through the computer system interface, routes it back to the PC for the, to the software. This is just live, these are live examples of some current vendor solutions for integrated microscopy. So again, that camera sits atop, mounted to the microscope, and uh, can be used for capturing images or live streaming even. Digital gross photography. So these standalone, these solutions exist as either standalone or mounted, and uh, these are really for digital, digital pathology, specifically for gross imaging, to capture high resolution gross photos and can be integrated in the lab information system or patient report. The digital pathology ecosystem. So this is the workflow that pathologists need to be made aware of. So the first step is all of the information systems of the hospital. So the hospital information system, which sends your ADT feed pretty much to all of the other enterprise information systems. The PACS, which is your image storage and communication servers, the LIS, the laboratory information system, the EMR, and the radiology information system. So all these information systems need to communicate with the digital pathology system, which ultimately consists of hardware and software, hardware being the whole slide scanner and the software being the whole slide image viewer. 
And in the digital pathology systems, the tools that are available, which can be computer assisted diagnosis, any applications that are native to the vendor or third party applications uh, that can be used to manage and manipulate these whole slide images, uh, specifically for image analysis or otherwise. So this is just an example of the ecosystem and some of the uh, exa examples of each specific subsystem. So the hardware can include the whole slide scanner itself, the monitors that are being used, the PCs that are being used to, to capture all of these images, and any of the input devices, for instance, uh, input devices to view the images on uh, the PC, whether it's a mouse or another input device. Software is inside image viewer, any of the applications or algorithms that are developed. And this is just an image of these subsystems and to follow the pixel flow. So the pixel flow is actually important when we'll talk about regulation, so just keep that in mind. Uh, there's, and there are also a lot of steps that happen throughout this process. So again, the hardware and software is the subsystems and the slide scanner and the whole slide image are only, you know, are, are a large part of these systems. So everything from slide scanning, robotics, to optics, the tissue detection on the from the scanner, as well as actually acquiring the whole slide image, the reviewer, where are these whole slide images being stored, the file format and compression of the whole slide image, and image analysis. So these are the four main steps of uh, the digital pathology process. So if I could coin the term arms, so it's kind of arm wrestle between man and, and technology, right? So there's the acquisition, image acquisition, the retrieval or storage of these images, manipulating these images, and then finally sharing those images. These are the two predominant ways that whole side scanners will uh, scan these images. And so the original method, which was the grid pattern, the mosaic tile-based pattern, which is what we discussed and how it was done originally, where you take each field of view, each field of view and go in an X, Y direction to capture all of the images. Now, most of the scanners today will use a line scan. However, some still do use the tile-based acquisition method, but the line scan will scan each, you know, the entire slide in the uh, short axis and then just continually go to the next direction. So this is an example of what one of the slides looked like while it's scanning. You can see the, sh the strips that are there and it'll scan it in a line uh, based manner. There's a slew of uh, whole slide scanners available on the market. So the two on the left here are more of the high throughput scanners. This is actually an Im immunochemistry scanner. So this actually is the first scanner to scan, cover, slip, uh, sorry, uh, stain, this, stain this slide with the IHC, cover, slip it, and scan it all at once. So we're starting to see more condensing uh, of these, you know, usually traditionally siloed scanning processes now. And this seems to be the trend going forward for a lot of these vendors, where they're trying to minimize the amount of steps involved. So we're trying to make it very lean. And then here we can see, similarly, there's just a camera attached to this microscope. And this camera, again, has a feed out to the computer. So this is actually a camera that will stitch together the photos as uh, the user manually views the image. And uh, this is a lot, these are much cheaper solutions that obviously they compare to these larger whole slide scanners. Some of these scanners can do fluorescence. Some of these do whole slide. Uh, robotic remote telepathology and the amount of throughputs of these that obviously vary from low to high. Inside these whole slide scanners, there's it's ultimately a microscope with an integrated digital camera. So that's that's a that's a must. And then depend there are different robotics as well as slide tray integrations with all these different whole slide scanners. And whole slide scanners, so as I've said, require an integrated sensor CCD or CMOS with, with the objective and the, the microscope lens. Or this whole slide image is really just the reflection of the glass slide that I'm currently using. So there are a lot of artifacts that can be produced in whole slide imaging. So pre-acquisition artifacts, you know, cover everything from the glass slide quality assurance beforehand. So if there are tissue folds on the glass slide, if the colors 
uh, you know, if there's poor staining of the glass slide, carpal slip misalignment can cause hardware failures, air bubbles can cause tissue detection uh, failures. And then during the actual scan, if there are ink dots potentially on that glass slide, it can lose camera focus or focus in general, uh, depending on the plane of scanning. How well is the tissue recognition on, uh, for the whole slide image? And uh, dead space, dead space refers to and pretty much any of the white space on the slide that doesn't have any tissue. And uh, color calibration of the slide, of the uh, whole slide image. Whole slide images can't fail scanning, so a lot of the, the tolerances of these whole slide scanners can't really or do not really detect or are able to scan very thick glass slides. Sometimes if a slide breaks and you know you attach a glass slide to the bottom of it, whole slide scanners are already made to do those in high throughput. However, they may be able to be manually scanned. Uh, depending on how the whole slide scanner grips the slide, if the slide is broken at the slide label, but the whole slide scanner, you know, grab, has to grab that whole has to grab that glass slide from a slide label, obviously that slide will have some scanning failures. And then depending on the tissue recognition, if some of the material is too pale, uh, you may the you know the whole slide scanner may fail that scan as well because it doesn't recognize any tissue on the slide. So the whole slide, there are different types of whole slide scanners and I'm breaking them into four main categories. So I'll break them into high throughput, low, real-time robotic whole slide scanners, and kind of a emerging, interesting competitive field with uh, integrated image capture and mobile whole slide scanners. So the high throughput scanners, predominantly for large labs, high volume labs, they range between 100 to 400 slides per run. And some of these have what we'll call continuous loading. and. Uh, this means that you're able to actually stop, not, not, not stop the scanning process, however, load and unload other slides that have been completed for an actual continuous process to not disrupt the lab's workflow. Obviously, there's a much larger and will take a, a, a larger lab footprint. The low throughput, traveling for smaller labs, ancillary low volume use case scanning, and these can range anywhere from one to 40 slides per run and these will take a much smaller lab for a print. Yeah, you see there's an example of a single slide uh, scanner, which is a handheld device that was recently, uh, that was made in the, in the middle there. You can see it's scanning a single slide. Real-time robotic whole slide scanners have a real big telepathology use case, and these allow the pathologists to remotely control the slide. So you just need an attack or somebody to put the slides in and then the, the pathologist can remotely control, they can pan, zoom, focus, all in real time. And obviously these lend themselves for frozen sections. These really have uh, an average of about four slides, so from low volume for frozen sections. And uh, some of these can be used for whole slide scanning afterwards in the event that the lab wants to save those whole slide scanning instead of just the real time use case. And this competitive, relatively new space, so for remote countries or places that maybe don't have the infrastructure or money to start whole slide imaging on a large scale, there are some solutions that will integrate either a camera or any type of device that has a camera to integrate it with the microscope and using image stitching software can compile a whole slide image. So these will capture a single slide per scan. Obviously, these are much less expensive and are much more widely available to the public. But the advantage of this is they're less expensive, they're much more widely available. Disadvantage is that the quality does not necessarily compare with a uh, commercial whole slide scanner. Okay, so these are actually, this is actually an important slide in terms of if anybody's ever a director of informatics at their own institution and they want to know really what, what do I really need to know when I'm evaluating post slide scanners. So obviously this is an extensive list and by no means is it complete, but it should cover a majority of the very important factors. So 
I wish I was going to skip to the end because cost should be the, one of the first analyses that you need to know how much do you have to work with. And going through the list, pulse line imaging file types are also very important because depending on the, depending on vendor interoperability, one whole slide image may not be able to be pulled up in the viewer of another company's whole slide image uh, viewer. So the whole slide image file type is very important. You need to know what are you scanning? Are you just doing bright field surgical pathology or do you need to support maybe a renal transplant division that, that needs fluorescent for whole slide images? What type of slide capacity are you looking at? Low volume, high volume, do you need a variety of scanners to support different departments? You know, what are the, what's the actual scan speed? And a lot of the vendors will tout, you know, oh, we have the fastest scan speed, but scan speeds can be different things. So scan speeds can be the actual just scan from, from the time the slide is loaded to when the file is generated, or it could be what's my actual scan speed for an entire batch of slides, which includes any of the robotic grippers using the, the grabbing the slides, placing them on the stage, moving the stage around, homing it, etc. What type of slide size does the department need? Are you just doing the traditional slides? Do you need to do whole mounts, for instance, for prostates? So different whole slide scanners can accommodate different uh, slide sizes. What what image capture magnifications do you need? So different whole slide scanners can have 20x, 40x. 63x objectives inside them to, and depending on the objective, you get different resolutions. And you need a flexibility of the scanning magnification. So, so, so a lot of the earlier software is you can only scan a batch of slides at one magnification, 20x or equivalent 40x resolution. But a lot of the newer solutions, you can do this through your software. You can actually select per slide what image magnification do you want, and um, for each specific slide. Okay, obviously take into account prefer and slide handling. Does it support barcodes? Can this be integrated with your lab information system? Does it have support for multiple scan areas, or do you have to scan all the dead space in between two levels of the slide? Does it have Z-Stack support? What are the rescan rates? Um, Again, we talked about the slide image file format, lab space, countertop weight load, uh, live viewing needs for robotic technology. This is a list of the whole slide image files and the formats. So again, each respective vendor has their own proprietary image file format, and these may not be interoperable with different with each of their respective viewers. This is the structure from Supplement 145 from the DICOP Supplement. So this is the whole slide image object definition. And you can see how the format really describes how the image is called in the whole slide imaging file format. So it's the pyramid. So at, at the very high level, it's a much lower resolution image. And as we're getting, as we're calling more and more pixels with higher magnification, we're getting a much higher resolution image. So. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Mantano, always says, you know, if you're looking at a football field, you need to see, you need to have similar resolution as looking at it from about, you know, 30,000 feet in the air from a blimp. And to see with the same resolution as you're zooming in onto a great blade of grass. So that's kind of an analogy towards what a whole slide image uh, pyramid structure can be defined as. And then we talk about these 20x, 40x. However, these are really equivalent resolutions that these whole slide images have taken on. So 20x is about, and these differ depending on whole slide scanners, about a 0.5 micron micrometer per pixel, and uh, 40x is about an equivalent 0.25 micrometer per pixel. As an example of a whole slide image, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure many of you have worked with them, and you know you can get up to very high resolution areas and look at a lot of detail and these can be zoomed in, panned around, etc., rotated. So a lot of these images, uh, you can do much more, uh, so we'll replicate what you can do with the microscope but are meant to do much more than just replace the microscope. Whole slide imaging, you know, we're used to our fine and coarse focuses but we also, 
there are some use cases in mythology that you do need to capture these images in multiple Z planes. So these are predominantly useful for cytology, heme, heme path, and there are different ways that these can be captured. So looking at this slide here, you see that we have a 3D cluster of cells in between the slide and the carpus slip. And a traditional Z stack, you'll just image in one Z plane and then you'll go to whatever interval between that and you'll, and you'll continue scanning each Z plane. But you can see that the actual image information will be much different from this top Z plane from the bottom from this cluster of cells. I'll put a little asterisk here just to say that there is another way to do this for the, the third method, which is called extended focal imaging. So what this will do is it'll take It'll go through and take the best resolution from all of the Z planes that are captured, but it will not, it'll stitch them into one image, one Z plane, as opposed to having multiple Z planes to have to focus through. So this extended focal imaging will actually go through, and it takes more time, however, it de decreases the file size compared to having three times the file size of a Z stacked image. And then some whole slide scanners will actually. Uh, tilt the slide to have a, what they quote as a better, different, uh, better imaging for Z planes. Just some examples of some clinical file sizes that are present in radiology and pathology. So, you know, clinical endoscopic image is a high quality image, which would be about seven megabytes. And then you can see as we increase further, whole slide images obviously are much more data intensive and will have much larger file sizes. The 40x are larger file size than the 20x, and obviously the more tissue that's scanned, the higher the file size, as well as the amount of Z planes. So a word on whole slide image viewer. So obviously whole slide imaging needs viewer software, and because the vendors have these proprietary image viewers as well as proprietary file formats, they may not be interoperable. Open slide uses technology to decode these and you can view them in a single image viewer. And uh, whole slide image viewers also offer annotations and viewing of the multiple Z planes if they're scanned in that way. There are a lot of different whole slide image input devices that can be used. There was actually a study out of Sweden that compared you know, a mouse, a trackball, and this particular six degree of freedom uh, input device. And they found this Cisco Freedom mount to be most preferred by the pathologists there because you're able to have the different, in, uh, you're able to readily control pan zoom and focus the images with much more efficiency than the other input devices. This commercial device on the bottom left is called the iSlide, which is by Bioimagine. So they actually wanted to help pathologists and make it much more of a seamless transition for digital pathology. And this is actually uh, similar or akin to pathologists who don't use a stage on their microscope and just move the slide around with their fingers. So this is almost a touch panel or touch track trackpad for the pathologist's fingers to move around, to, act, to move and, and manipulate the whole slide image. It's an example of a pathologist workstation, potentially in a future, not too near future world. So on you know, one screen you have your lab information system that's, that has all of your clinical data as well as your slides being archived there. And then on the right, you have a much more digital workflow where we're manipulating these digital images and whole slide images. It's an example of a clinical system that was uh, in use. You can see this, this would potentially be a list of patients and each one of these would have their respective whole slide images attached to them. And you can see that, you know, it would tell you how many slides there are. There could be color coded, color -coded dependent on if there's a H and E or if they're immunostain. You have status indications. You have, you know, referring physicians, accession dates, and you can even assign priorities. You can have folders, different folder structures. You may have a medical legal folder structure, QA, these can be easily shared, right? So these are ultimately being stored as links in a image server or in a database. And then these links uh, can be shared very easily electronically as opposed to moving the physical data. 
some of these systems can incorporate different pulse light images from different vendors. So if you see here, you know, this was from one from Omnix pulse light scan, one from Imperial, one from Hormatsu. So they may be able to incorporate multiple different vendors. Also, just to mention the search functionality, just because I think it's probably one of the coolest things that we'll be able to do is just easily search for cases as well as pull up that case data. So it's much more accessible. With that, if a patient has a history and you need to pull up that case to compare for metastasis, it's very easy to just pull that information up from a historical case within that patient's information. Some of the other benefits that pulse line imaging can, uh, software can give us, so there's much more, there are different ways to look at and pan around the image. So instead of just clicking, dragging with the mouse, you may be able to click on a particular area on the thumbnail and you get an overview to see everything that's on that slide. And uh, some viewers actually have a heat map of what was viewed. Some pathologists like this, some don't, because then it opens it up for much more medical legal information in terms of what was actually viewed in the slide before the diagnosis was made, at what magnification was it made, and you can see that that information is rendered depending on the color. So the somewhat of a controversial issue is whether to include heat maps or not in terms of these whole slide image viewers. This is an educational application that you can see has the slider here that can look at, that can go through the different focus groups. So if you look at this particular subgroup here, you see the cell underneath, you can't really have that as good as detection, but here you, you can make it out a little bit further. You can be able to put pulse light images side by side, or you can do co-registration where you can look at a particular area, especially for comparing cellular means to chemistry. Uh, so these are also very useful. And then this particular image viewer, you'd be able to click on the next where you can keep the H &E static here and just carousel through the other immunist chemical stains that are there. Also for medical legal or even just for capturing image to put in reports, you can have an annotation section where you're using your annotations and those get captured and saved, archived with the case, and instead of having to look around the slide again and see what's there, it's all captured here. And then these are all links to the particular X, Y, Z coordinates on the slides so that when you click on them, it'll link you straight directly to that area on the whole slide image. And this lends itself towards media-rich reporting where a lot of, you know, we are a customer-driven uh, department where we want to provide value in our reports. We want to provide high quality data to the surgeons as well as patients and other customers. So media rich reporting, we can have digital pathology as well as gross pathology. And input any of our comments. You can also have gross images uh, incorporated right in the application. So these are the main use cases. So primary diagnosis of which is FDA is still not approved, and we'll discuss that. Second opinion, telepathology, use it for QA or PT training, archiving and sharing of data um, cases, education, image analysis, which is a huge emerging field, research publications, uh, marketing, business, and uh, tracking training. That primary diagnosis will define uh, surgical pathology. So diagnosing a surgical pathology microscope slide in lieu of a microscope. So that's what a whole slide image, that's what the FDA defines this primary diagnosis. So we are not referring back to any glass slides after diagnosis of the whole slide image. We're purely looking at it from a digital workflow and the glass slides uh, are being stored in an archive somewhere. But we're finalizing the report based on the whole slide image. So the FDA has not approved this for uh, primary diagnosis in the United States as, as yet. However, in Canada and Europe, they've been using host slide imaging for workflow for years. So for second opinions, you know, there will be significantly decreased transferring of blocks, slides, and these will really be trans transferred into just sharing a link for the host slide image. Then Blocks that need to be reprocessed or get new stains can be ordered upon request. 
Telepathology is just spoken through robotic, both side scanners. These can be real-time robotic uh, imaging. We can either do live streaming or reporting of these for frozen sections or for consultations from other hospital systems. Archiving and sharing of cases, as you know, we were talking about, these can be stored in uh, enterprise archives. You can use them for image analysis, and there are a lot of you know, big companies in the field now, Google, Facebook, these are all very interested in these aggregated uh, whole slide image repositories and pretty much for image analysis or computer learning, machine learning. So archiving and sharing, not even just in, within the department or within an enterprise hospital, these are also have a lot of commercial uh, applications. Education, so in medical school is now they're going away with a lot of the microscopes and a lot of them just have digital images. And this is a trend that's not going away, as well as even in our pathology training, a lot of focus is using digital images for conferences, for other applications, especially for tumor boards. These are much, uh, much newer technology that they're hoping to be incorporated in a lot of these educational or conferences. QA, so we know that in our laboratories there are variations in terms of color staining and imaging can be used to share centralized uh, color stain, uh, whole slide images of glass slides that were stained and can be used to uh, for QA of these images. Research and publication, so in the future, you know, it's very possible to include whole slide images in a research article and have the actual reader be, have a much more interactive experience and uh, view a particular case that was published on. Image analysis. So image analysis is a really big emerging field now, and there's a lot of resources being allocated for this commercially and uh, locally in the hospitals. So color normalization is a big pre-processing -pre step for image analysis. So as I mentioned before, each full slide scanner has its own method of color calibration. And all of the information is stored in the pixels. So the image analysis is really glorification of analyzing that physical pixel data. So if you have different pixel data from the same image, Sorry, if you scan the whole slide image in multiple different whole slide scanners, you may get different pixel data within even just the same glass slide that was scanned. So there needs to be a color normalization step in order for image analysis to accurately be performed. So some of the main steps for image analysis, the goal is to classify these images. So you can classify them by annotating, okay, there's a person in the very left image, there's a sheep, there's a dog, and then actually detecting those, so this is kind of annotating those physical cells on the whole side image, and then actually segmenting those and classifying them based on what they are. So different areas of image analysis that are really used in area quantification, so pretty much quantifying things, uh, either with area, the quantity of cells, or feature quantification. So rare event detection, such as mitosis. The FDA has approved breast IHC markers. It's the only FDA approved image analysis product that's available on the market, but there are many new companies entering this space. Uh, it's a larger range for artificial intelligence and machine learning, and uh, the really current month. There currently isn't much known about the future regulations for the algorithms, if they'll need FDA approval, or if each lab will just be able to use them. So there are our digital pathology, so the, the digital pathology application that was published on in, uh, a few years ago was, you know, the automated detection of AFB. So these take, you know, a very long amount of time to screen through a slide for a particular AFB facilities. So this used machine learning to automatically detect these, and you can see that you know the first you can detect that of these which ones are likely AFB. When you look at space L, just because the pixel data matches the same color, but it's not actual 
bacillus, you can detect that it's not an AFB. So we have, there's a lot of different colors in pathology. And color is obviously very important because the color represents the pixel data that we're getting from this. So there's a lot of variables, whether it's the tissue thickness, the staining protocol, the, cap, the sensor that's in the whole slide, uh, scanner, calibration of this, the viewer software, the monitors all have different color settings, maybe even within the same department, and any post-processing that happens. And you can see on the right, you have the same exact image, but with different pixel data between them. And will this cause differences with image analysis? Will this cause, you know, maybe differences in diagnosis? Unlikely, but image analysis more likely. So I'll briefly discuss a few of the challenges and then we'll conclude. So the FDA in the United States has uh, been somewhat of a barrier in terms of approving whole slide images for primary diagnosis. So the FDA approves medical devices based on intended uses. Even though OCAP has published guidelines for validating these in clinical practice, uh, the FDA still has not provided this based on uh, clinical trials that have been submitted to the FDA of late. But the FDA does not necessarily regulate the practice of medicine, which is why this image is interesting to know. So we really practice medicine in our own silo, which is regulated by its own governing bodies, but the FDA regulates the whole slide vendors, the whole slide imaging vendors. So they regulate how the products are sold, and the products will need, likely be sold uh, within that pixel pipeline that we, we were discussing. So everything that covers the acquisition of the image to the display of the image, that's all side scanner, processors, the, uh, the monitors, the, the physical monitors themselves, those will need to be packaged in a system sold to by, uh, from the vendors. But the pathologists can practice medicine as they see fit and are not necessarily um, need to be regulated in that way. Licensure, so different licensure models, these are state mandated models, so specifically for interstate consultations, having a state license in New York, you may not be able to sign out a case that was, uh, you know, that in a, in a near, nearby state. So there were some methods, so some states actually allow for consultation exceptions. Uh, there has been a nationwide licensure proposal for a telemedicine license, but that would be a federally governed model. So. These are challenges that are now being tackled. Billing, right? Everybody wants to get paid. That's the whole, per you know, there's a lot of uh, issues in the department that we need to make sure that costs are covered. So healthcare is governed by Medicare, Medicaid fee service, right? And then we're reimbursed based on a physician fee schedule. And then CMS authorizes the use of these AMA provided uh, CPT codes. So. CPT codes pretty much describe to the payer what the physician is billing for. And we do have CPT codes for, uh, you know, inter we use CPT codes every day with our billing. And a lot of these can, can uh, lend themselves for digital imaging. Primary diagnosis, again, is not approved yet for all slide imaging, so we're not sure if we can actually use the first line of CPT codes. And then specific for image analysis, the, the bottom two, uh, those are new CPT codes that for, are actual for computer-assisted analysis of these breast immunohistochemical markers. Some of the limitations include vendor interoperability, obviously having the approval of this administrative, departmental cost, need to look into maintenance contracts, the actual storage for all of these you know, archived images, you want to make sure you have adequate lab and IT support. This is a culture change. You know, pathologists who have been practicing for 30 to 35 years may not be too excited to transition to a digital era. Then we also have digital grading of tumors. This is a field that's, you know, just recently being tackled. And, uh, you know, how do we go from a whole, from a high power field on a microscope to a high power field on a digital monitor? I mean, are they all the same in the viewers? What, what exactly is 40x on a screen? You know, we're going from a circle to a rectangle, so a lot of variables in terms of that. And so I'll conclude, uh, and then to pretty much all the topics that we discussed today. And if you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer any of them.